good. Good morning. It's been an exciting day already here at Faith Community Church. It's been a real blessing to be able to, um, to sing about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a joy it is to, to be able to fellowship like we have had the opportunity already. Well, this morning we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you have need of a Bible, these fine gentlemen would love to put one in your hands. Just slip up yours and they'll make sure that you receive one this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I titled this message, People Get Ready, because I was thinking there are two songs that come to my mind when I think of this passage of Scripture. One is Crystal Lewis singing, People Get Ready, and the other is, um, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And you may remember that. I think that was, uh, I always want to say Greg Norman after the golfer, but it was Larry Norman. You remember Larry Norman? Am I dating myself? I am dating myself. <laughs> yes, yes. I've got a story to tell about that, but that's for another time. Take your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. We considered last Sunday, and we considered it in light of, is there really life after death? And we examined the aspect of the resurrection, and we looked at the reality thereof as we explored verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14 says this. But that we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. And that was a euphemism for death that was common, not as so much among Christians as so much about among those in the world. So Paul says, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Paul goes into the next verse and he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. If you take notes in your Bible, you want to note that word in verse 14 where he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. It's better translated, and so I have it circled in my Bible and off to the side I've written the word since because that's really how it should be literally translated out. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, remember in Paul's day, there was no question, there was no issue whether or not Jesus had risen from the dead. In fact, Paul would go on and he would say that there are hundreds of witnesses to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and many of them were still alive when he was writing that. And so we know that it was a factual event, one that is absolutely without uncertainty. Here we are hundreds of years later, and we're looking at it from a different vantage point. And so there would be some who would come along and would say, well, maybe he rose from the dead, but maybe he did not. But we know, in fact, that Jesus has risen from the dead. God says here to us in his word, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Do you see that word of the Lord? Just underline that. This is not some new revelation that was without basis. It's not like the Apostle Paul is saying, as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that it's my opinion that you're better off remaining single because of the day and age in which we live. Paul sometimes used his opinion and he set it forward but here he is saying there should be no mistake that this passage is a revelation from God that is the word from God this was new revelation to these Thessalonican Christians they were understanding something for the first time and the Apostle Paul is going to bring it to bear upon future generations like us as we have the opportunity to come along and look at this same passage of scripture. Let's look to the Lord, shall we, this morning and ask him to bless the word of God for us. Father, we thank you that you've given to us this revelation. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that we have when we read it and understand it. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to what you have for us today. Help us, Lord, to be guided by your spirit as we look at these very precious words here in this paper. May it be an encouragement to all of us we pray it in Christ's name, amen. You and I need to have peace about our future in Christ Jesus because in his life and death, the Lord Jesus has truly prepared to care for all of us. 
The actual event here, and I'm looking now at verses 13 through 18, is described here in 1 Thessalonians is a reference to what has become known to be the rapture. He says here for us in verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. We who are alive until the coming of the Lord. I, interesting, it's interesting to me that Paul writes this and he uses the word we. He doesn't say, you know, you guys, hopefully uh, down the road you'll be alive. The Apostle Paul says we, <laughs> understanding that in his mind, quite possibly, he viewed the return of Christ as imminent. He viewed it as imminent, and not only did he view it as imminent, but he also viewed it with an expectancy. He was expecting that it would be something that would transpire in his lifetime. Now, Paul is making some things very clear here. When I say Paul, understand that I mean that God is revealing it through him as God has given to him the words to pen. One of the things that stands out here is that if we are blessed to be alive when Jesus returns, we will still not precede those who have previously been buried. I remember coming to Christ, it was 1964, the month is April, so it was a long time ago. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I knew that I was on my way to heaven, and very shortly after that, I heard about this doctrine of the rapture. And I was sure as a young boy growing up that I would be raptured, that Jesus Christ was going to come back in my lifetime. And if you asked me when I was 10 years old, do you think you're ever going to die? I'd say, I don't really think so. I think Jesus is coming back, and I'm going to be with him. And I was in the 95 percentile probably thinking that back then. Well, here we are. We're 50-plus years later, and I'm looking at it, and my expectancy of 95 percent has dropped. <laughs> it's dropped. Now, I still believe the imminency of the Christ is a reality. I believe Jesus Christ could come at any moment. I believe he could come during this service. But the problem is I've gotten older. I don't expect to live another 50 years. And as I've gotten older, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, the, the odds are starting to go the other direction, Kev. But here's what the Word of God is saying to us, and here's the point that we should understand. Paul is basically making this statement, there is no advantage, according to what I just read, for those who remain and are alive and go to meet the Lord in the air. There's no real advantage over those who have previously died who are in Christ. It, you see, as the time goes on, we recognize that those who precede us those who have already died at this moment that we're going to be looking at here in this passage, they will actually receive that glorified body just a twinkling of an eye before us. I find it interesting that God's word doesn't tell me to dread death. It doesn't tell me to dread it. It tells me that there's going to be a new life that begins when that occurs. That's why I like that song that we sang so much this morning. Because it really does speak to the issue, doesn't it? And the funny thing is, as, as time has gone on, and I was 95% convinced that Christ was going to return in my lifetime, and now it's more like 30%. It has nothing to do with Jesus, but everything to do with my age. I find that the fear that I had of death has also diminished. You see, it's not something that I would look at in dread. In fact, I look at it from a different standpoint. I look at it as the scriptures have described it, and I realize the wonder of what is coming for me as a Christian. To receive a glorified body, to be immortal in the heavens with Christ, to be walking with the Lord Jesus and walking with loved ones who are also in Christ is beyond my understanding. It's so amazing. And so when God speaks to this issue, he is going to talk about the importance of understanding that you shouldn't grieve, he says to these people in Thessalonia, that, that you shouldn't grieve like those who have no hope because you have nothing to worry about. Even though these have already passed away, listen, don't be despondent over that. These are all part of God's plan. 
every single one of them. And if Christ tarries and I fall asleep, I'm still part of God's plan. Isn't that wonderful? It's so encouraging to know. Now notice with me here in this passage of Scripture how this all works out. Because what God is going to tell us here is the event known as the rapture as it's described here. He says that it's all going to begin in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Whoa, shout, right? Loud noise. Going to get our attention for sure. It's a shout of command, literally. And it's the voice of the archangel. Jude chapter, Jude verse nine rather says that the archangel is Michael and that's most likely who this is. He goes on and he says with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and those who are dead in Christ then will rise first. Now I want you to see a couple things here. One is the fact that this takes place, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It's not a messenger, my friends. It is Jesus Christ himself coming from heaven for his church. Ephesians chapter 5 describes that. It talks about the, the union of Christ and the church. And we understand that best in the imagery there of marriage, where the two become one, the husband and the wife. He says, even as Christ has given himself for the church. And the church is going to come back and the church is going to be blameless and holy and presented then as the bride of Christ. How fantastic it is when we think of Jesus' return and how wonderful it truly is. You see, the Bible would describe for us uh, these events of the end times. And I believe that this is a passage of Scripture that speaks to the time when Jesus Christ will take his church out of this world. As Jesus takes his church out of this world, what ends up following that is seven years of tribulation, and that seven years of tribulation is a time frame where you have Daniel's 70th week that is prophesied over in Daniel, and you say, I don't know what that is. You gotta come to the Bible study uh, on Wednesday night through the summer. We'll be dealing with that. Uh, but it is that time where the Jewish people are, are finding the wrath of God is such that they can't refuse to, some of them understand that Jesus is Messiah. And there'll be a spiritual rebirth that takes place there. That the wrath of God will be poured out upon this world. But Jesus Christ is taking his church. You see, Jesus Christ is coming back for his children. The Bible would describe over in Matthew chapter 25, and whenever you go to Matthew chapter 25, you have to be careful because some of that is pertaining to the second coming of Christ, I understand. Uh, but there's that parable about the, the ten virgins. Some of them are ready and some of them are not ready. And some of them go and they, they miss the coming of the bridegroom. Throughout scripture, I find it fascinating that there is a lot of passages that speak about watching for the return of the Lord Jesus. That we should be aware that Jesus Christ is coming again. When I think of what it's going to be like at the end of the tribulation, there'll be so much destruction on the earth. People are basically going to be focused on, on survival. We have to be very careful as the church today that we don't fall asleep spiritually, that we're aware of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming soon that he could come at any time, that the shout could be heard and the trumpet sounded. And these dead who are in Christ will go to meet him in the air. How important it is when you look at that passage of scripture to be in Christ, the dead in Christ. You see, the issue here in 1 Thessalonians is not so much whether or not you're dead or you're alive. The issue here is whether or not you're in Christ. It, it, it's, it's going to, you say, well, yeah, but I don't want to die. Well, I guess nobody really wants to die, and we'd all rather be raptured, but the truth of the matter is what really matters here is whether or not you're in Christ. Amen. Is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you been truly, as Jesus would say, born again? Such a key, such an important point. Some would say that this trumpet, some would say that this shout would be heard by the entire world. Others think that it's only the children of God who hear the trumpet and hear the shout. 
I know one thing for sure, and John 10, he talks about the sheep, and he hear the shepherd's voice, and they hear him and follow him. I don't know if the world will hear. I don't know if they'll be able to detect. We know that certain things are going to happen. People are going to be vanishing off of the face of the earth. Some of the tombs will be opened up, and people will come forth. You imagine the impact of that. You say, well, that would change the world, and people would come, and they would place their faith in Jesus Christ because of that. But if you think back, I think back to the time when Jesus rose from the dead. Do you remember what happened in, outside of Jerusalem? How some of the tombs were opened up and some people came forth? And I'm sure that those people were probably well known to the people in Jerusalem. Hey, there's my uncle. He just died, for, you know, four months ago. Or, or, or you know, there's grandma. I, she's been dead for 10 years. And, and, and they knew who these people were. And it had tremendous impact. And yet everyone in Jerusalem didn't come to Christ. Not everyone in Jerusalem responded positively at all to that. And so when the rapture takes place, I'm not certain that in the lives of many, there will be much of a difference. It's very hard to say. Notice in verse 17 where he says here, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. The word for rapture, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, rapture is really not in the Bible. It's not really written in the Bible. The word there that we're speaking about is the two words there, caught up. Caught up. Arpazo is a Greek word to be caught up, to be forcibly seized. And it is this pulling away due to divine activity that is being described there in verse 17. That we who are alive and remain will be, he says, caught up together with them. The Latin that's translating that Greek word, by the way, is rapturo. We get the English word ra from rapturo of rapture. And that's where that word comes from. So if you draw a little circle around those words, caught up, and you put that out in the margin, that is the word rapture as it's come down from the Greek Latin and now to the English. And this reference is an interesting event. It's distinctly Christian. There's nothing, for instance, parallel in Jewish literature anywhere. It seems like it's a very unique event. And the part I really like is when he says, and so shall we always be with the Lord. So shall we always be with the Lord. When this takes place, everything else is over. Isn't that great? We will be no more looking through a glass darkly, but we will be face to face. Is that joyous or what? That is really exciting to know that we'll forever be with the Lord. Are you ready for that to happen? That could happen today. So the reason for the rapture is we've looked at these actual events and we've looked at the elements of the actual events. The reason for the rapture is to meet the Lord in the air. That's what this is all about. And so we'll go and we'll meet the Lord. He tells us here that this meeting is very, very important because in the Hellenistic Greek, this becomes actually a technical term that spoke of a ceremonial meeting of a, with a person of great position. Um, there's some, some writing in the papyrus that's uh, spoken of uh, as an official delegation going out to meet some newly appointed magistrate or dignitary. The idea is that this meeting is almost ceremonial, where Jesus Christ has come for his church and will go up to meet him. This is a big deal. We don't want to miss it. And the great news is you can't miss it if you're in Christ. So this is going to be something of great, great significance. Actually, after this event takes place, this rapture, as it were, this being caught up to be with Jesus, we find elements in the scriptures that talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, talk about the judgment seat of Christ, which is when the rewards will be given out to those who have been found faithful. And these two events are going to be during that time of seven years of tribulation that follow that rapture. 
And so everything begins to be set in motion. You see, today we live in the age of grace. The church age began way back at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where you have the Holy Spirit coming upon the Jews. Later in Acts, the Holy Spirit comes upon the Samaritans. And further after that, and finally, the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles. But that was the beginning of the church age. The church age is consummated at the catching up or the rapture of the church. And so the church age is made up of all those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ, who are in Christ, from the time of Pentecost all the way up until the time of that trumpet. And so God is adding today to his church, isn't he? More and more people are putting their faith in Jesus. And this is why he tarries today. How wonderful it is to stop and, and to think about the coming of the Lord. Verse 18 gives us another reason here uh, to stop and, and understand the reasoning for the rapture. Verse 18 says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. I find it hard to believe that if I was going to have to endure seven years of tribulation where God is pouring his wrath out upon the earth, that I could comfort you as we anticipate the coming of Jesus. Oh, listen, we're going to get together. And the good news is it's only seven years of tribulation. Now, if we had to go through the tribulation, that's the kind of thing we'd talk about. Uh, oh, yeah, all that death and destruction and judgment, uh, I guess we've got to go through that too. And so we'd probably build bomb shelters for ourselves, right? Uh, we, we would literally go underground. But the Bible tells us to comfort each other. Comfort each other because we know that this day is approaching. That as we serve the Lord and as we, as we follow Christ, there is a measure of comfort to be taken from this. And the, it's interesting that word comfort is, it points to animated cheering and speech and words that bring us peace and comfort. It's true this world will, will face the wrath of God. But the Bible tells us that we as the church are not appointed unto the day of wrath. We bear not the condemnation of our sin because of the grace of God. And so we look forward to a resurrection that will happen. And some of us may still be here when Jesus comes back, and others may have gone into his presence already. But one of the things that is for sure is, in the whole scheme of things, it's not going to matter. What matters is whether or not we're in Christ. And so that first resurrection that takes place is the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He is the first fruit of that resurrection. You know, it was said that Pilate scolded Joseph of Arimathea for giving up a very, very valuable piece of real estate to be used as the tomb of Jesus. Pilate said, what in the world are you doing, Joseph? You shouldn't be giving that up. That was worth a lot of money. And Joseph said, that's all right. He only needs it for the weekend. <laughs> the second resurrection is the resurrection of church age saints. That's what we see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And that's going to take place, as we know, when the Lord Jesus comes third part here is the resurrection of tribulation and Old Testament saints. These are those who are outside of the church age. They're not those who were saved between Pentecost and the rapture. We're talking about Old Testament saints, people who believed in God, put their faith in God, and also people during the tribulation. Again, that's a time uh, for, for the Jewish people primarily, not for the church. And it is during that time that they, many of them will perish, but they will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation time. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll note a distinction here when Jesus comes for his church here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, does he touch down on the earth? No. We go to meet him in the clouds, just like the slide up there. When Jesus comes back at the second coming, the Bible describes his coming, and his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives and split the Mount of Olives. There's a huge difference between those two events, I believe. The resurrection program is, is exciting because Jesus... Our God is the first fruits, and we will follow in his steps. The last resurrection is the resurrection of the unsaved dead that takes place in the book 
of Revelation. When is this all going to happen? What is the timing of this event? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. It is absolutely essential that you look at the facts of Scripture and make a decision about Jesus Christ that will ultimately lead to you putting your faith in him. Today, your faith rests in something. I wonder if I go back to the time of the Apostle Paul when they were talking then about the rapture. I wonder what the discussions were like. As a youngster, we talked about the rapture all the time. Do you remember those little things you could put a little sticker? I, I, I grew up in a time when it was okay to hitchhike. I'm pretty old, I know. But we used to get those little stickers and we used to put the sticker on our dashboard in case of rapture, this car is unmanned. And you'd pick up these hitchhikers and they'd jump in and it gave you an opportunity literally to share the gospel with them. But when I went to Bible college, they still talked about the rapture prank that took place two years before I got there. And knowing some of those guys that perpetrated that prank, I'm not surprised. But they got hundreds of people in on this rapture prank, prank and, and they pranked this guy. He thought, he, he, he didn't know what to think. He, he came back from work or something like that, and the whole dormitory, you know, there was razors in the sinks, and, and uh, you know, people, you know, their clothes just dropped as if they fell right there, and, and, and he came in, and he went nuts. I mean, like, like it messed him up for a long time. In fact, <laughs> it, it became a rule that you couldn't do a rapture drill, that's what we called it, um, in Bible college anymore. It was that serious. Well, we used to have a lot of fun talking about the rapture. Of course, we were all absolutely certain that it was going to happen in our lifetime. But I remember a film that we watched. We went to a, a place up in Tremont Temple. It was the name of the church up in Boston. And there were thousands of people gathered, and they watched the movie A Thief in the Night. And after the end of it, they, they spoke a little bit, and they gave an invitation, and literally hundreds of young people came and place their faith in Jesus Christ. I remember that movie. I remember this girl having a dream. She has a dream, and she wakes up, and she's looking up at a guillotine, and they're going to chop her head off for being a person who is in Christ. And she wakes up from this dream, and whew, she's so glad that it didn't really happen, but it turns out her husband was a believer, and then the rapture actually occurs. Amazingly, Two minute clip from this movie. It changes her life forever. Reports keep coming in from all over the globe confirming it as true. To say that the world is in a state of shock this morning would be to understate the situation. The event seems to have taken place at the same time all over the world, just about 25 minutes ago. Suddenly and without warning, literally thousands, perhaps millions of people just disappeared. Do eyewitness accounts of these disappearances have not been clear, but one thing is certainly sure. Millions who were living on this earth last night are not here this morning. Speculation is running high that some alien force from outside our system has declared war on the planet, and some feel it to be a spectacular judgment of God. The United Nations is in a special emergency session. Jesus Christ is reported to be the speaker. 
and he says, and I quote, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. This clip was not going to be uh, too clear, and the sound was not going to be very good, and I said, that's perfect, that's just, just how I want it, because that was pretty much how we saw it. <laughs> You know, over the years, you know, now we have the Left Behind series and uh, so forth, and, and the cinema is, is much better, and the, the special effects more, uh, uh, more graphic and clear. Uh, but the gospel is not changed, and the reality of the rapture is still with great impact. Uh, there will be people in the world who will try to explain this event And they will struggle to understand it. And eventually, some will seek out the scriptures. The Bible describes 144,000 Jews who will be saved during the tribulation time who will go out among the world preaching the gospel. And there will be many who will be saved. All of that will be taking place during this time of tremendous judgment. And people will be losing their lives regularly because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the scripture that says now is the acceptable time of salvation. And it truly is. But who would want to endure such difficulty? The razor's in the sink because Jim was standing there and it always gets me when I think of that movie. And I think, yeah, the song that goes along, I wish we'd all been ready, speaks to the issue. Maybe you're here this morning, and in the honesty of your heart, you'd say, I'm not sure about where I'm going to spend my eternity. I'm really not at ease. I'm not at peace about where that's going to be. Our faith, all of us have some faith, and it rests on something. We're either trusting ourselves to be good enough to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Maybe we're trusting in a different religion that is outside of Christ. Maybe we're trusting in a uh, syncretistic religion where we have Christ and we have this God and that God and our faith is spread out among many. If you're here today and that's you, then in your heart, you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity. Because it is only those who are in Christ who have assurance of their salvation. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Has it been established? Has it been set because of your faith in Jesus? It's nothing that we have done. It's no religion on our part. There's no goodness on our part. All I have done all those of you who are here who have made this decision, all we have done is committed our faith to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except it be through me. And we believe that. And so the offer stands for you this morning. In Scripture, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from the penalty of our sin, which means then you will be in Christ. And those who are in Christ will be part of this spectacular event that the Bible speaks about. And lest you think that this, this event that is described here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the only place it's talked about, there is a lot of evidence in Scripture. I think we spent three and a half, four hours this past summer studying the rapture and all of the pertaining passages of Scripture. My friends, Jesus is coming, and he's coming for his own. Is your faith in the Lord Jesus? If not, I trust that today would be the day that you make the decision to commit your heart and your faith to Jesus Christ. You decide today to place your faith in him. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Have you received that gift today? We're going to have a word of prayer. And after the prayer, we have uh, a trio who they are going to sing an old 
southern gospel song that speaks about the return of the Lord Jesus and then our care and concern folks will be up front here and uh, if you want to know more information about putting your faith and trust in Jesus come up here and speak with them or find us this week uh, we'd be happy to talk to you let's pray shall we God and Heavenly Father we thank you for the words of this passage of scripture Lord we're reminded of your great love and we're reminded of it when Jesus comes to meet us in the air, to call us home. What a joy, what a blessing. Father, we know that in ourselves, we didn't deserve this, but you have been so generous to your children. May you use us, Lord, this week. May we honor and glorify you because we love who you are, Lord, and we are so blessed. Work in hearts today, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.